Murley and trying to understand the human brain, which I've been trying to do my whole life, uh, increasingly the external environment is becoming more and more important. When I was studying neuroscience, it, it almost had nothing to do with the studies that, that I was doing, but it's increasingly so. Uh, you've been focusing on social neuroscience. Uh, what are the implications of that? How does it work? Um, and um, how do you see the significance of social neuroscience in understanding the, the human brain? Social neuroscience is a combination of many fields that have sort of come together under this umbrella term, if you will. There have always been studies of social psychology going back 30, 40, 50 years, uh, dating back to you know, deprivation, if studying the effects of isolation, studying the effects of taking away babies from mothers. You know, there have been kids who grew up in the wilderness uh, mm -hmm. for 14, 15 years raised by apes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so those studies have contributed a wealth of knowledge to our understanding of human behavior. Now, what social neuroscience is trying to do is to try to understand what are the brain correlates of the behavior changes that various social and environmental paradigms uh, have, have been linked to uh, behavior. So one of the core aspects of social neuroscience is something called social cognition. So social cognition relates to a couple different things. Uh, one, it relates to what are the mental processes we use to relate to other individuals, and indeed how we view ourselves. The second thing is, what are the hidden biases, and the, especially in terms of how we make judgments about others? What are the neural sort of defaults that we use, if we will, uh, to make judgments about others subconsciously? Uh, and some of these are actually bad judgments, and some of these are good judgments, but what are the processes by which the brain mm -hmm. automatically makes fast judgments mm -hmm. about other people? Uh, so, and there's a whole bunch of other things relating to empathy, moral decision-making, uh, compassion, theory of mind, emotion rec uh, uh, recognition. How can I recognize whether you're happy or sad? You know, what are the brain circuits involved in that? And so those kinds of studies are what are called social neuroscience studies. I'll give you a classic example of a social neuroscience study. Uh, and, and, and this study kind of suggests that there is an intrinsic racism amongst all cultures. They showed a photo. It just had a black face. And they showed it to a group of people from all cultures. They showed it to Caucasian whites. They showed it to African Americans in America. They showed it to Chinese. They showed it to Indians. They compared the amygdala response. The amygdala is sort of the emotional thermostat, if you will, in the brain. Just seeing a black face versus seeing a lighter colored face. And they found that the black face triggered a heightened amygdala response than the lighter colored face. This is across all groups. Across all cultures, suggesting that there is a, even amongst African Americans. So it's a very surprising finding. And, and what it suggests is that there may be some hardwired evolutionary traits that have come up over years, hundreds if not thousands of years, that are sort of built into our brains. And understanding that might somehow help us find ways to overcome that. Yeah, is that clear that it would be hardwired? Why not? Why wouldn't it be just culturally it's induced? It's cultural. It's culturally, but it's culturally induced over several generations, or it could be culturally induced since childhood, yeah. early childhood, yeah. potentially. Can, can you distinguish between culturally induced from childhood or hardwired by genetics over multiple generations? Those are, those are two radically different things. They are two radically different things. I think there's many social behaviors that are hardwired over several generations. This one example, I don't know if people have tried to distinguish where it came from. It's possible that if you studied you know, a baby that's completely out of touch with all human civilization that's raised you know, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a sort of an isolated cave, you may not see that response. And but, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But it's very interesting that there are babies who have this rare condition uh, where uh, they actually show no racial uh, uh, preferences whatsoever. The condition is called Williams syndrome. <laughs> so maybe we should bottle that and uh, sell so it to the world. A, but it's very interesting because in America, 
kids with Williams syndrome are seen as actually a, a great example of what we should all aspire to be. In some Asian countries, kids with Williams syndrome are seen as uh, not as desirable in the sense they're seen they can't distinguish between different classes. Mm, mm. So, so and, and class distinction is much more important in certain Asian cultures than it, it currently is, at least in the mm, Western culture. Mm. So, so it's culturally driven, as you pointed out. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a very significant... It's genetic and cultural. Right. What, what, what are the implications in terms of our, our own mental fitness and understanding how the brain works and indeed the social interaction in terms of making myself not just a better person right. for others and for you, but right. for making myself stronger and healthy for myself. Right. So there are two very interesting studies that came out, both pr published in prestigious journals. One is it compared, they showed the same face, a fearful face, to two groups of individuals. One group of individuals were living in densely packed urban environments. The other group was living in a rural, sort of very idyllic sort of environment. The people in the urban environment showed a heightened fear response than the people living in a rural environment, mm -hmm. suggesting that the environment is revving up our stress system. Mm -hmm. If we can identify those kinds of triggers, we can then put in some intervention. So what it's suggesting is obviously if you live in an urban environment, you either need to move to a rural environment or you need to find ways such as meditation, et cetera, to, to reduce your stress response. And you need to be aware of it. We know that there are many mental diseases that have a higher risk amongst those who live in the urban setting. Okay. So that has direct implications. Second is what I call vitamin N, N for nature. Okay, okay nature therapy. Studies have shown that a walk around the city They've tested people on memory, asked them to walk around the city block, a busy Manhattan block, retested their memory, and they repeated that experiment while the person walked in a park in Central Park. Mm. Guess which yeah, one yeah. Had, the folks had an improvement yeah. in the memory yeah. if you walked around in the park. Yeah. So these kinds of social studies, uh, basically what they're suggesting is to improve your mind. Uh, I think your environment has a dramatic effect on your mental abilities. It's not just genetics, it's your environment has a at least 40, 50% effect. Yeah. And the impact of the, that would be uh, not, not just you're improving society, but you're improving yourself, right. and it's recursive. Plus, it has a, you can scale it. If you could make minor changes to the environment, you might be able to affect an entire community rather than focusing just on an individual. Mm. And the contribution of neuroscience to this uh, sort of grand social re-engineering? Well, the contribution of neuroscience, I would say, is to try to better understand brain circuits, and through brain circuits, you educate people, and it convinces them more to lead healthy lifestyles. I would say it's a tool. And in your practice, in, in working with uh, patients who have different kinds of mental diseases, do you use environmental factors in mediating uh, treatments? Because you, you use uh, th uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, you use uh, uh, various types of therapies, I'm sure, but do, do you engage environmental activities in your therapy programs? So I must confess that most doctors, including myself, are very poor. There is no environmental prescription yet, but I think the day will come, just like now we're starting to write an exercise prescription. You know, 40 years ago, there was no exercise prescription. Now we're starting to write a yoga prescription. Uh, I think eventually we will be changing the environment. Already for Alzheimer's patients now, it's not uncommon for a social worker to go to a patient's house. I think that's going to be the norm.